SJC 12043, Commonwealth v. Michelle Carter. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Curran. Why don't you give us a moment? May it please the court, Dana Kernhan for Michelle Carter. Uh, with me is Attorney Joseph Cataldo and Attorney Corey Madeira. Uh, we contend that verbally encouraging someone to commit suicide, no matter how forceful the encouragement, does not constitute a crime in Massachusetts. If you gave them the weapon, would it? If you if gave you them said, the weapon? You really need to do this. By the way, here's a gun. Go ahead. It, it might. That's uh, person Perry. Yeah. So, so there's, there's a step at which encouraging becomes, could become criminal. Well, encouraging together with, uh, with actual conduct. Okay, so if the person has a gun and says, I am going to kill myself, right? And you're saying, yes. good, 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 go for it, do it. I don't know. No, no, come on, come on, pull the trigger. Is, does that step over the line? I don't think so. Or is so. that still okay? I don't think so. I think that's, that is, uh, that, well, I mean, in our case, we have, we have somebody who was 30 or 40 miles away, and the, the only thing that happened was some, she said verbally encouraged him to get back in the car. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying. All right, we've talked about killing myself. We've discussed how we're going to do it. How, how did the location, who decided the location where this was going to take place? I'm sorry? Who decided the location at which this he did. suicide? He did. He did. She, didn't, she didn't contribute to that decision. I, I, there, there may have some, been some discussion about where to, where to go do that, but... Um, you see, the, the part of the problem is that Massachusetts doesn't is one of 11 states that doesn't have a, a statute addressing this this type of behavior, uh, encouraging suicide. Well, okay, but we do have an involuntary manslaughter statute which talks about wanton and reckless conduct resulting in the death, causing the death of someone, and at some point, can verbal action become wanton and reckless if it results in someone's death? Well, there, there may be circumstances where it can, like, for example, yelling fire in, an, in a crowded movie theater, uh, but that's more of a verbal action. So I'm in the truck, and I, I'm dying, and I, just, uh, I have to get out. I get out, and I call my friend, and my friend says, get back in the truck, kill yourself. That's not enough. That's just talk. That's not. If somebody said, if she said, if she was physically present and she said, get back in the truck or I'll put you back in there myself, or uh, here, another example, standing on the edge of a bridge, jump off that bridge or I will push you. The uh, or I will push you would probably take that over the line, but jump off the bridge would not. But, but taking that analogy, you're saying that there is no amount of verbal encouragement for somebody on that ledge to jump would be sufficient to be wanton and reckless, no matter how, no matter what the psychological state is of the person standing on that ledge. That's right. What, what if the, the people are in love and, and, um, and, and the person who is not going to jump says, if you love me, jump? Does that take it any closer? I don't, I don't think it does. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't see how it does take it, take it closer. Uh, it, it's not, See, the, the example I gave of, of um, yelling fire in a, in a crowded movie theater, that's something that's false. That is, okay, I'm going to say something that tricks people into running out the, the, the door, and then, of course, there's no, um, there, there's no actual act, uh, intentional act of anybody in the movie theater trying to take their own lives. Now, if, if the conversations had been the uh, the victim here, let's assume the victim um, had some people that he really hated, classmate really hated, and said to your client, I, I want, I'd like to kill that guy. I really want to kill that guy. And your client said, that's terrific. I want you to do it too. Here's how we should do it. This is the place. You can get a weapon at the hardware store. I know where you can get a gun. And... Um, Go and do it. Well, I'm not. Go and do it. Go and kill him. Would that be a crime? I don't think. And he kills him. 
I, I, don't, I don't think verbally encouraging someone, I don't think, that, I don't think that would be a crime. Wait, wait, wait. I, I mean, you mean if, if somebody solicits a murder? If somebody we, solicits we get, that, we get that all the time. So somebody solicits the murder of a spouse to spare them the need for alimony? <laughs> it's words alone. Yeah, that's I, not a crime? I, I, I think that, that might be, but, but I think... Um, but that would be a, because there's an underlying crime right, of right. murder. And here, as you're arguing, so what, the, tell me again, I can, it's hard for me to remember the name of that case that involves the only incident that I can see in our jurisprudence. Per person Perry? Person Perry? That's the 1961 case. That's the case husband involving a, sir, a, a husband and wife who'd been, she'd been in a battered situation. Is that the one? Uh, I, I, there, I that was part had. of the fact, circumstance, and then he said, I'm going to leave you, and she says, please don't, please don't. And he says, well, you know. I'm going to kill myself. Well, you've said that before. Go get a gun. Here's the gun. That one. Right. And she tried to load it, and she couldn't load it. So he says, here, I'll load it for you. Loaded it for her, gave it back and to her, and she couldn't open it. He said, take your shoe off, and you can use your toe. Right. That one. So, uh, and, that, and the factors there, how do they differ from this? The factors there is that he was physically present, and he actually loaded the gun, got the gun, loaded it, uh, told her how to do it, and he, he was essentially facilitating it. You're not suggesting that the current facts are not reprehensible in some way. I'm You're not. You're suggesting that there's just no law against it in the common law. Right. It was. It was not a crime. It. Uh, see, the the problem with uh, with involuntary manslaughter, with an affirmative act, is that um, the affirmative act. Is, it, I mean, th there has to be causation. There has to be prox proximate cause. Now, well, we're talking probable cause now. I know proximate. We're talking all we have is an indictment. And the question is whether it should be dismissed because there's no probable cause before the grand jury. We're not talking about jury questions. Well, the facts aren't going to get any better. The facts are, were, are viewed in the light most favorable to the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, viewed in the light most favorable to the Commonwealth, they're not going to change. Uh, she, to she, may, she may have told him. That, I mean, it, let me put this in perspective. For He had attempted suicide in the past. And... He was talking about suicide again, and she, for a long time, tried to talk him out of it. And finally, about uh, two weeks before it happened, she said, okay, if you're going to do it, go ahead and do it. And then she started encouraging him to do it and talking to him about how to do it. But even when she said, get back in the truck, uh, there was another, th that was not the proximate event that resulted in his death. He then physically got back in the truck with the intention of taking his life, and he sat there and he waited until the fumes ov overcame him. Is there so. anything in the relationship that you're aware of between uh, the juvenile and the person who killed himself that would suggest, that would have suggested to him some consequences if he did not follow through with what she had said to him? No, absolutely none. And, and I, don't, I think she had not seen him for, they had not physically seen each other for a year and a half at the time of, of the incident. It was just a, a, a phone and text relationship at that point. So that, so that there was nothing coercive no. that you're aware of in the relationship between the two people? Absolutely nothing. And, and wh why is it, I know you say that words alone cannot be wanton or reckless, but why is that? I mean, if, 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 if I encourage somebody to engage in a game of dare, let's see who can sprint fastest towards that cliff and stop as we approach, as, stop at the, at the furthest point of that cliff. And in playing that game, the person I'm playing it with doesn't stop in time and jumps over. Falls is, over. Is that not, you know, falls over. Is that not reckless? I, I don't think so if that person makes a decision to participate in this activity. So, but we had the Russian roulette case where they, willful, they, they, they willingly agreed to play Russian roulette and we found that to be wanton and reckless to engage him in that kind of a game. I think that was an, there was an underlying crime. What was the underlying crime? Um, well, it, it, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it definitely, probably something with the firearm, but um, I think they, there was a finding that they were engaged in a joint venture to... Uh, take someone's life. If I understand your argument, um, you would say even if, if there is, even if all the questions that are being put to you, the answer is uh, yes, that, that would be enough. 
you still have the language about threat of injury in Section 54, right? I think you do. I think you do. And the judge found that there was a threat, but the Commonwealth concedes, and I think correctly so, that there was no threat in this case. And I think if you look at Felix F., there was no threat. She didn't say, if you don't kill yourself, I will whatever, fill in the blank. So that's what we, all she said is, get back in the truck. And that's the key that the judge found, but I suggest that that wasn't enough. To give you an analogy. You need to have what here? You need to have infliction, then you have to have the infliction of bodily harm, right? You have to have infliction. And the undisputed evidence is that Mr. Roy inflicted the harm. He's the one who got the generator, who drove to the location, who set it up in the truck, who turned it on, and who got in the truck. So, you know, there's nothing that she did, there's no physical act that she did to inflict it. What about the theory of omission, where arguably she had encouraged him to commit suicide, had tried to dissuade him from not committing suicide when he expressed some doubts and reservations and suggested postponement? Did her role in these conversations somehow create a risk of serious bodily injury that she had a duty to alleviate? I don't think it did, because I don't think this kind of duty has ever been recognized just by encouraging somebody to do something. There's no, the cases talking about this duty talk about parent, child, employer, employee, or where you physically create a danger, so, for example, starting a fire. The other point, with regard to the youthful offender statute, to the extent that that requires infliction, there's an omission here. So I don't think that qualifies as a youthful offender under the youthful offender statute. Now, I mean, this is a crime that involves death as a consequence. Death caused by actions of the defendant. Why isn't that enough to satisfy Section 54 on the youthful offender statute? Because it's not a crime, and because the proximate cause... If it is involuntary manslaughter, it surely is a crime. Well, that's kind of, it's a little bit of a circular argument, because just calling it manslaughter, I don't think makes it manslaughter. Well, I know, but let's assume that we say the grand jury had probable cause to return an indictment charging involuntary manslaughter. Would you say, well, okay, but that doesn't involve the infliction or threat of serious bodily injury, when the result of involuntary manslaughter is, by definition, someone's death? I think the result here was someone's death. The problem is that the death was caused by the victim himself. Again, he's the one who set up this whole situation, and once she said what she said, there was another event that took place, which is he got in. But I guess what my question is this. If we conclude there was probable cause on the question of involuntary manslaughter, doesn't the Section 54 issue go away? Well, I... We conclude, in fact, the conduct of the defendant, as the grand jury learned about it, was involuntary manslaughter. It could have been. The jury could conclude it was. Then surely 54 is satisfied. If it's involuntary manslaughter by commission, then that probably does satisfy youthful offender statute. If it's involuntary manslaughter by omission, it probably doesn't. But your argument essentially is that wanton or reckless conduct can never be words alone. I'm not sure if I'm saying they can never be words alone. I think they probably have to be words plus, and maybe words plus means... And what's the plus? The plus is something like a falsehood or a threat. So if I yell fire in a crowded movie theater, what I have said is false. I have not said, you know, you should all leave through the back exit. What I've said is that there is a fire here, and you better get out of here. And the verbal conduct, it's not just expressing an opinion or 
uh, encouraging you to do something or whatever. It is actually tricking you into running out of the movie theater very fast. What if the plus is persistence? Um, I don't think persistence is, um, is, is, a, is an element. Um, I think it has to be something in the content of what is said uh, or in the context. Usually if, if, there's, if the plus is a threat, if the plus is a falsehood, then in, in certain circumstances, maybe. But if, the, if it's just, you should go kill yourself, you get back in that truck, it doesn't matter how persistent she is, it doesn't matter how reprehensible we might think her conduct is, it simply isn't a crime and it was not at the time, and we can't make it a crime retroactively. You're saying that encouraging somebody to do something that's not only stupid, but potentially deadly, is not a crime. It's not. So if, if we had a situation in which she had said, let's see how long you can hold your breath in a car with a generator running. Let's see how long it'll be before, before the, how long we can stay before we fear we're gonna die. And then it turns out the person stays too long and dies. The person who encouraged that game is not guilty of a crime? I don't think so. Okay. Unless there are any further questions, I'll leave the remaining points to the brief. Thank, Thank you. you, counsel. Good morning, Your Honors. Shoshana Stern for the Commonwealth. Your Honors, if I may just address Justice Hines's question about whether essentially um, the Carter had any coercive power to enforce, you know, if you don't do this, then. Um, I think she made it clear in her conversations with him from prior discussions that she would be deeply disappointed in him if he didn't carry through, she would be angry at him. And she also said, if you don't do this, I'm going to get you help, which is a good thing, but it was clear from the context of their relationship that he feared that deeply. He did not think hospitals would help. He, that that was something that even though a normal person would think that help was good and killing yourself was bad, that that might, that the grand jury could have interpreted that as sort of a. Uh, okay, let's, this is, this is in my mind the sort of $100,000 question. Mm -hmm. When did this cross the line? When did these words cross the line? I think that um, it's always, be, because this is such a sort of collective picture of a human interaction, it's very hard to draw a single line. Involuntary manslaughter by um, wanton and reckless conduct is very frequently very fact specific, um, but just sort of by its nature in general. Um, but I, I think that we know, we can say that we know that she was way over the line when she told him to get back in the truck. Okay. And I think that the prior interactions are important context for that. I mean, if some random stranger tells you, you know, get in your truck and kill yourself, most people are gonna be All like, right, so let's, go away. Let's say that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Enough? I think it is still enough. I think it's much stronger with it, but I think that she has been, even just within that single day, she, they've been talking about it since 4 a.m. when she wanted him to do it then. She wanted him to do it at every juncture they talked during that day. And he was nominally on board with it, but he kept doing other things and she kept talking about, you know, I thought you were gonna do this, I don't understand, what's the point of all of this? You know, you keep saying it, but you never do it. Promise me, you can't break a promise. Promise me that you won't um, get caught on purpose. Um, and that essentially this, this has been a continuous narrative for a number of days. They've only been dating again for a month by her representation. So she has, she made statements in the past trying to stop, convince him to live, but the, there's only an entire month there. And I know my counsel was saying about two weeks that she's been now talking about how, um, you know, that this is what you need to do. You've tried to save yourself. It doesn't, it's not going to work. Your family knows you're gonna do it. They're not, they're prepared. Who picked the location? How was the location of where this was to take place decided? There was a lot of discussion, I believe, even on that day about where would he get caught, where would he not get noticed. He also didn't want anybody, he didn't want to get caught too soon and he didn't want anyone else poisoned. Um, and so she gave him a lot of input. He ultimately tells her he's decided on a place, but they've said it's been a continuous, um, and if she had picked, the, suggested the place, he might very well. They're, they're, they're not, 
he doesn't overrule her. It's a collaborative process. The entire, so, so is the selection of the method of killing himself. She has ideas about what will and won't work best. I take it that the selection of the place was so that there would be no interference. Yes. No he was possible. worried that somebody would think a kid in a car was, and she, like that at 4 a.m., she's like, do it now, it's less conspicuous. And then when he wakes up in the morning, she's like, no, actually, this is less conspicuous. Do it right now. You can't put it off any longer. Most people don't think this hard about killing themselves. Get on with it, essentially. Um, if, if, if you prevail, mm -hmm. what happens with the person who has ALS, who is contemplating their own suicide to mm -hmm. avoid the consequences of the latter stages of ALS and they speak to a friend and they seek the friend's advice as to what they should do and discuss whether or not it would be wise for that person to commit suicide. Well, I think, Your Honor, that that is what comes to, um, where it becomes crucial that this is by its nature a very, very fact-specific crime, that it, it very much depends on the circumstances. There's no bright line rule for all wanton and reckless conduct. I mean, obviously some things you throw something in the middle of the highway. But I mean, a lot of it, when you're talking about what a person is likely to do, um, I think there's a number of important differences. Um, one of them, though it's not the critical one, is that I think there's some debate as a society about assisted suicide for terminally ill people, but not for depressed teenagers who haven't found the right medical treatment yet. There's no, that, that we, as a society, I think we're generally all on the same page that those people should be kept alive. We can civilly commit them to keep them alive if we think they're going to try to kill themselves. I think asking a friend for their thoughts on your plan is different from ha having, a, a, if he'd said, you know, I'm suicidally depressed and I want to kill myself, and she's like, well, that's unfortunate, but, you know, I see where you're coming from, that is entirely different from the degree of to which she was pushing him out of his own reservations. I mean, when he says, you know, I don't want to leave my family, I love them. She's like, don't worry about that. Here's why you don't need to worry about that. Don't let that stop you. The difference if someone is um, with ALS mm -hmm. uh, asks more and the discussion is more, let's keep the same hypothetical mm -hmm. going for a minute. And uh, so it's over a long period of time and the person with ALS is getting increasingly more ill and more concerned and also concerned about leaving family. Mm -hmm. Need understands that might need help. Mm -hmm. Can't do it alone unless someone's really encouraging, because that's going to get to that point. Mm -hmm. uh, the psychic pain mm -hmm. takes over. And uh, at, at what point in that hypothetical does it cross the line? Well, I think to a certain extent it depends. Here's a, here's a cocktail. This is what you take. Uh, I can't move my hands. Will you put the straw? That point. I mean, I think the ultimate question is sort of ultimately who's driving, that, you know, it's, it's one thing to say I need help with my plan, but he's, she is pushing it harder even than he, it, it may be something she thinks he wants, though I would also argue, I know my brother brought up the issue of w it matters with trickery. I can't make any claims about what was going on in this case, but the grand jury heard evidence that she was writing to her friend the day before he killed himself, or two days before, saying, you know, he's missing. I could have done something. I should have known this was going that to happen. That kind of trickery goes to whether the, the conduct yeah. induces induced. That, that's yeah. completely but, but not no, related. but I, I mean, it's, I, I know there's no good faith exception for speech, but I think that th this is not, um, I mean, the fact that she is both cl telling him to do this and telling other people it would be horrible if he did this at the same, and she would stop him if she could. Well, we're now dealing with yeah. your facts and your view. Yes. I mean, obviously, you know, at the well, trial, I mean, presumably, the grand jury she has would be able to argue that she always wanted that. And mm -hmm. as she said, actually, I learned that one way of dealing with suicides yeah. is to p pretend to go along. But we're not there. We're, we're on your facts and your view. So let's go to the yeah. hypothetical about mm -hmm. someone who is dying and, or maybe at least becoming cased mm -hmm. in their own. Um, imprisoned in their own body and wants to commit suicide and ask for en help and encouragement because they're hoping uh, to, to, to be successful, mm -hmm. but they need someone else to really I encourage them to do what they think is the right thing most of the time. I think it's a detailed determination based on the facts of the case, and it comes down to the specifics of what the grand jury and the jury hear. And ultimately, I think that's a distinction that they can draw. But it can be a crime, even and if I, you have ALS, and, um, and you're just Depending helping. on the circumstance. I mean, not everyone with ALS necessarily is, I, I mean, again, it, it depends on the spe specific fact set. I mean, if you, let's say you have a relative who does not want to deal with their relative with ALS and is trying to convince them that this is what they want. I mean, you wouldn't, 
there's a distinction between that and when it's the person with ALS who really, really knows what they're doing. Bad and if they're an adult. about it. Right. What? Sorry, Your Honor? You'd be glad if they were dead rather than it, you'd be sorry. I mean, I, I think it depends on the two particular. Glad if they didn't have the pain, but, or whatever. So it depends on the motivation of the person? Um, I think that. The person who's listening to the person who's depressed, because in both situations you'd have depression. I mean, I don't know whether we, I don't know if we've decided sort of exactly how as a society we feel about the ALS hypothetical in so Massachusetts, it's, frankly. It's that we haven't decided as a society how we feel about Um I don't. In order to avoid the horrors of last moment suffering, and we haven't decided how we feel about that, but we have decided how we feel about people who are depressed taking their own lives. I think that in just sort of the general narrative that one of those is more of a question under discussion than others. I don't think you have to decide either of those. I don't think you have to decide the ALS hypothetical to decide this case. I think, um, again, th as a matter of common law, suicide has been a crime, has been a homicide. We have backed away from that in our case law, but have never said it isn't anymore. It's, it's somewhat ambiguous, so in that sense, if, if you go on the last sort of law on the subject, then it's it's a By crime itself, and, the person and it's joint who, venture. But so in other words, the person who tries to commit suicide but fails can be convicted of um, attempted suicide? I believe that there's a what case. What does it have to do with the person who <coughs> encourages or speaks with somebody who's saying, I'm going to do this? Do you have uh, some obligation to stop them? Um, I think that it, in general, you don't have an obligation to stop people from doing things. In the Russian roulette case, they said, you know, you have an obligation not to play along if somebody is going to put themselves in danger. Um, obviously, some means of doing that could be said to be stupider than others. But um, in ter so, I mean, to a certain extent, it comes down to is this something that, you know, we think. I, um, but on the issue of um, attempted suicide, I believe that was resolved by a case saying that you can't punish it because you can't punish the completed offense. And the, um, the punishment for attempt was proportionate to the completed offense. But just in terms of the question of whether suicide is or is not in the crime box as opposed to whether you can actually do anything. Legally, I mean, you might not be able to have a joint venture with it, but um, it's not, I mean, there, there are very sympathetic fact patterns you can get into about assisted suicide in the broad context, but I think that this case should be viewed on its own facts. Um, I think it can be decided narrowly. I don't think we need to go to that issue, which is a very contentious you one. You say that, and if, we, and if you were to prevail, mm -hmm. we, would, we would probably say we need not decide the ALS case mm -hmm. because in this case we have, and then the question is what follows? Um, I think you have a very emotionally vulnerable young person, somebody in very close um, emotional proximity to him. She may not, they may not have seen each other. They were talking nonstop during the day. It may be a generational thing that there's not case law on this, but they, they were in constant, in very deep emotional context. He told her everything about his sort of emotional state. Um, and he kept essential, I mean, there's, he tried to commit suicide before he'd been stopped. He'd been saved for a while, he, at worst, but. Um, well, when you say stopped, um, stopped short of what? He, he told a friend and the friend called the police and he went to the hospital and was treated. Um, in this case, he told a friend and she told him to get back in the truck. But um, obvi obviously, it, but it, it all in this case depends on whether, essentially we're arguing, it, it essentially, it comes down to whether this is a case where, well it comes down to a number of things, but whether they're giving advice for the person's benefit, or I think, I mean it might, it may be that you can't be somebody's driving influence of why haven't you done it yet? If you want to kill yourself, you need to do it now. You know what's wrong with you that you haven't done this yet. Would this Is be a, a case if she hadn't said, get <clears throat> back in the truck? Mm -hmm. would, would this be a criminal prosecution? Um, I can't speak as a policy matter. Um, I think that there would be sufficient evidence. Um, but um, I think that it certainly heightens the, cause, the causation. Um, you know, I seem to recall uh, um, there was um, there was a series of incidents with people uh, encouraging somebody to jump off the top mm -hmm. of a building. Do we know if any of those were prosecuted along these lines? I don't know, Your Honor. Um, I think that 
I would argue they probably would fall under this logic, but I don't know if they were prosecuted. Yeah. Do, do you know if the assisted suicide cases uh, have involved a, uh, a, a somewhat more, mm -hmm. or at least a passive role on the part of the doctor that h has assisted the, uh, the patient to commit suicide? I don't know for I mean, sure. Is there an issue of encouragement in those cases? Um, I don't know. I know my brother cites a Minnesota case that's about the general encouragement of someone on the internet about suicide. But I, I would like to emphasize that again. I mean, frankly, if this, if she had just supported what, she, if, I mean, it. it I think the, what you're the, trying to say is, there, if even if this was encouraging, this was much more than that. It was yeah, really I mean, pressure. I don't know. I don't know that we would be prosecuting encouraging if that was what we pressure. really thought that it was. I think that my, what I was trying to get to with the um, saying different things to different people was just that the grand jury had in front of it facts on which they could have found probable cause that this went that this was not ultimately about what he wanted, and he was not in a position to decide what he wanted. Um, so you could have would it say that even if we had a law that uh, permitted mm -hmm. assisted someone assisting, this would still be a crime yes. under, under the Yes, I would say that, that this falls outside the bound. I know that the defense, this is the defense view of the case, but I would argue that that is not what the Commonwealth thinks it is prosecuting and that that is not the sort of behavior we're trying to get at. We are coming at this from the perspective that this is essentially somebody, I mean, it's sort of <coughs> voluntariness is not exactly on point, but essentially it's somebody doing emotional manipulation could be found to be on somebody who's very, very vulnerable to get them to do what they want them to do um, under a circumstance where they know that the person is likely to listen to them and likely to do it, and they know that if they do it, they're going to die. And I think that um, that, that, and also I think that in general, if you did have assisted suicide um, as a law, I mean, that, that would be a policy matter, but um, whether the person is in a mental state to be able to make that decision, I think is also relevant. All right, thank you. Thank you. And we'll take our morning break. All right. <clears throat>